Andrew Knafel of Clearbrook Farm in Shaftesbury, He's been growing strawberries for many years, and we'll share some of lessons learned about different systems. Hello, Andrew. Hey, Vern. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me, Vern, to uh, talk about strawberry production. It, it's uh, something I'm not always very confident about when I go into the season, but we seem to get by. And um, I think the takeaway for me is in some ways, strawberries are very forgiving. Um, but in any case, just briefly, our farm, we grow 25 or to 30 acres of veggies and mix and some strawberries in, included in that acreage and some blueberries. Um, and that was a great talk about blueberry pollination. That was really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, and we sell mostly through our farm stand. Uh, we, have, I mean, as far as strawberries go, definitely through our farm stand and a little bit wholesale and some, well, we'll get to some pick your own and things like that. And uh, we also have a bedding plant business and we're just sort of a general mixed vegetable kind of operation. And we started in our first season was 1995. And I think the first year I grew strawberries was like 96 or 97. Um, and I've tried a lot of different things along the way. Um, but first, let's see if I can advance those slides. Yep. Oh, too far. Gave away my secret. Hold on one sec. Okay. Um, so first off, just how we prepare for strawberries. Now we have enough land um, that we're able to sort of plan and uh, rotate strawberries very well, but we're able to plan the year before to have it, uh, our acre, acre and a half um, set aside in cover crops. And we do some early fallow in the spring. So we'll probably you know, plow down some rye or something. And then, uh, disc it a few times and sort of in mid-June we put in a cover crop mixture of some mixture of millet and sorghum and oats and peas sometimes there's some hairy vetch in there if we've got seeds kicking around whatever's kind of kicking around in the barn and make a um, make a nice mix and um, we'll generally some um, try and have have cover crops that we can mow at one time and something will grow up underneath and um, so it's, yeah, so like sorghum, you know, or, or millet, you mow off the oats and peas, and then all of a sudden that stuff is released and it, and it kind of takes over for the later part of the season. Uh, we plant nine, like I said, there are nine to nine, 9,500 plug or roots a year. Uh, and our spacing, we used to do 36 inch spacing between rows and um, we've changed that so that now um, we're planting like it ends up we're at 72 inch rows and um, I guess I have a slide talking about that later but it covers about one point one and a quarter to one and a half acres this year we're going to cut back to 8,000 roughly 8,000 crowns um, so that we can uh, have a little more take a little more care of what we're what we're growing um let's see waiting for it to advance so here's our favorite varieties after many years of experimenting um and certain varieties we grow that we have grown are no longer available like we love sable we used to grow sable um for an early plant early variety but it, we just can't get it anymore so we grow two different early ones galetta and wendy i really like wendy um for flavor and it's just a nice looking berry and it's great for pick your own galette is also nice it's nice to have two options early sometimes you know if one isn't doing as well i like to cover my bases um cavendish you know for anybody who's been growing in new england probably you've all grown cavendish it's a it's a fantastic fruit um sometimes they're just massively huge and uh I don't seem to have the problem. They used to get white shoulder or white sides, and I haven't had that problem in years. I don't know why that is, but I have been having some problems with establishment of Cavendish the last two years, and I'm not sure. It's probably us, but I'm definitely keeping an eye on it, and I have a couple new sort of mid-season Cavendish slot varieties that I'm trialing this year for next year. Um, I'm planting this year. I don't remember their names, but... Um, but just to see if, if there's some option out there or 
yeah, what's going on? We'll find that out. Jewel, love Jewel. It's not, for me, it's not quite as uh, productive as Cavendish and it's pretty tasty. I still, I kind of like Cavendish when Cavendish is at its peak. It's really, really good. Valley Sunset's a little bit lighter red, but for a late berry, it's, I, I think it's a really nice berry. And like I say there, the set's concentrated. So we'll get like three or four good picks out of Valley Sunset. And then we kind of call it quits on that. And then Masabi is really, really late, sometimes like two weeks after Valley Sunset. Um, and it's good, but we've had problems with tarnished plant bug because it's so late and uh, the flavor is good and everything. But it just by then we're kind of moved on from, from, from strawberries. My goodness, my crew sort of, they, they, uh, they kind of go on strike if I have to send them out two weeks after we stop picking some other strawberry to go pick strawberries. So um, anyways, uh, but this is how we plant. We use a single row. We, this is a Chechi transplanter that I bought and um, I didn't like it very much. So after three years, I just could not get it to plant well. Uh, it always had a deep furrow. It's just a pain in the neck. So I sold it and bought a mechanical on this chechi, you can see we bury our drip tape um, underneath the plant as we're transplanting. But uh, with the, when we, and I, so I, we, we made that one up ourselves, but when we bought the mechanical transplanter, they have an option for a drip tape laying berry, barrier or whatever they call it. It's great, it works really easily, we love it. Um, but as I say, it is a love-hate relationship and I'll get into that in a minute. But you can see here, I mentioned our spacing again, it's 16 inches in the row, um, 72 inch beds. And um, yeah, we used to plant with a water wheel for a few years, but it just took us too long. And I, I didn't really, it was just easier this time of year to, to spend the time just after transplanting onions with a water wheel for like five days, <laughs> full nonstop. You know, it's just nice to go to something that you can just get your berries planted really quickly and, and move on. Um, let's see. Next up is, oh, or yeah. So the, the irrigation, I, I do think it's pretty essential most years, you know, after we plant, like this past year, we, May was dry as a chip. And, uh, we, um, yeah, we, we use the irrigation to establish those plants. Cause you know, you're putting in bare, you know, bare root plants and there's no, um, you know, there's no soil around them. If, if you don't get moisture within a week, those plants really suffer. Then you can have huge gaps in your, in your rows. Um, but you can see it's really kind of cool. You turn the irrigation on and you know that small picture it's just starting to come to the surface after like four or five hours you know the drip it's 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 worked its way up to the top and you know those plants are pretty set um and uh, the the one problem you know it's it, well the one another good thing is you can cultivate over it because we're we are organic um but it is a, a little bit of a pain the following year after you plant after you've harvested we only grow for one year so we mow the we mow the, the plants and then we uh, have a lifter. We use our plastic mulch lifter with a cutting blade and kind of go under it. And then we get our, our drip tape winder and we wind it as we sort of drive and pull it up. It's kind of an ordeal, but, but it works. And I make sure someone else does it instead of me because I would go crazy doing it. Um, but it's a good beginning tractor job for somebody. So fertility, uh, we don't, uh, broadcast um, over this before we plant and partly because you know when six foot on center rows there's six feet that there's not growing a crop and I hate to spread fertilizer there because it just fertilizes the weeds so we have this clamp co people probably if you've seen me give a talk or two before I always talk about this this side dresser I, I love it in many ways and uh, it's metered for chicken uh, pelleted chicken manure that we use like crayers. So it's got a good distributor, like this meter wheel that turns and drops chicken pellets really easily and very, very exactly. And we have lots of downspouts, but I close it up to get about 500 pounds an acre when we go over the strawberries and we'll use the 543 crayers. And I like, so late May, it's actually late May, mid July and mid August. I was checking my notes uh, again that we, 
that we uh, fertilize three times over the over the crops. Because you know the other thing is you know you put those plants in, it takes them like three weeks just to wake up. So why have fertilizer there? Um, you know, it's just sitting there and it's not really being. I don't. Maybe it is being absorbed by the plants, but I don't think they're really taking up fertilizer until the end of May. Um, and then one other fertility thing is in the spring, um, as I mentioned there, if we have a bad year, like it's really wet or the plants don't look very healthy going into the fall, like this year, we, we had so much rain, I think over 30 inches uh, from, and from early June, like Memorial Day till October, I think we had 36 inches of rain or something. And just couldn't, you know, the plants looked really weak and couldn't fertilize enough. And um, so, so this spring I'll be, I'll be side dressing and then our rate is like 80% crares to 20% Chilean just because you don't want your berry. I don't think one wants to have their strawberries getting a shot of nitrogen as the fruit's ripening. So we, we try and get it on as soon as we take the straw off. Um, and then, yeah, weed control in quotations. Um, you know, we, we, like I said, we try and do a little stale seed bedding the previous year, but you know, then we grow a cover crop and till. And so we're probably bringing up weed seeds. So I'm not sure that really helps, but right as soon as like within about five days after planting, we'll go over the field with the Kovar, which is like a, you know, a blind tine weeder. And then as they start to get a little bigger, we have these crest fingers you see there, which is a, a pull behind, but we, we had mounted a belly mount with a, co, uh, with a belly mount tractor and a Kovar behind that tractor got in an accident. Luckily nobody was hurt, and, but that tractor is done. And um, so we went back to just doing this and then we'll go over it again with a Kovar, just an extra trip, but the Kovar is pretty fast. So um, it's not taking that long. And then once they start to run, we start to use some side, once the plants start to send runners, we start using side knives and, um, and then we start hoeing and then we start hand weeding and we keep hand weeding. Like this year was so wet, we just could not get on the field to cultivate. And this is the field from this, this photo is from this year. And um, it's a wet field and we just had so much rain. It was, it, this year was, we'll see what we have in the spring. I'm, um, I'll be very interested to see what shows up for, for plants. We do, we were raising our own straw. We had somebody, our neighbor, or not a neighbor, but someone in town would bale our straw and we use a round bale chopper. We love that. It's pretty easy. I can just do it myself in the spring, in the fall, in November, it can cover berries. But um, I think this year we're not going to get any more custom. The guy's too busy doing other hay and stuff. So I think we'll be buying in some round bales and there's no other farmers in town to, to help us out, I don't think. So we'll be buying some straw bales one way or the other. Um, and mulch removal, first week in April, last week in March. I bought this remover from Pooh Sprague a number of years ago and it takes about 20 minutes to set it up on our tractor and on the front and use it for about an hour and a half and put it away. And uh, I think I paid 500 bucks. Thanks Pooh, it's awesome, awesome addition. Um, and then frost protection, you know, I'm sure everybody probably knows, but you know, some years you get by without frost protection. We don't really have an, the irrigation system set up for sprinklers. We do drip. So we use Remay to protect, mostly it's just our early berries that, that bloom first that we end up having to cover, but you really want to be ready for that. Like that should be, you know, you don't want to spend five hours getting your Remay out of the back of the barn. If you, you know, on the night it's going to frost, it's nice to be ready for that right away. Um, but I would say it's a must-have a must-have op, you know, option because if you can't do frost protection, there's a good chance you lose your berries some year, not every year, but some years you could. And um, yeah, and then sometimes you look at that and you've got some potential there. Uh, nothing's guaranteed, that's for sure. Um, and I do wonder about pollination. This year we had an amazing flower set and the fruit set was pretty good, but I don't think it was as good as it should have been. Um, but when you see a field like that, it feels pretty good to know what's potentially coming. Um, let's see. So most of the, what we harvest, we'll harvest for the farm stand and, you know, just some basic things. We have clean hands, clean containers. So what my criteria for the pickers, um, we all have local, it's all local help, you know, 
and a lot of returning people. So, you know, I could talk about my crew. They're, they're the reason it all happens, but I'm talking about growing. The, but my crew is awesome and they're great pickers. But one of the main things I learned from Jack Mannix is no white tips. And, uh, you know, make sure your fruits right, right to the end, right to the end of the berry. Like I always have my crew, you kind of, as you're picking, you're flipping them over, taking a quick look at the tip, make sure that it's fully red, uh, no rot. So as the season progresses, you get a couple heavy downpours and all of a sudden your field smells like strawberry jam. And then you've got to be careful. And we try and pick with some trays that we just plastic trays to throw the bad berries into as we're picking to keep them out of the field and get them off the plants. Um, and we also believe when we display things, you know, these aren't really full, but we don't like to crush the berries when we stack the berries in the cooler. But um, we make sure when they go out that the, the stand crew tops off uh, the plant off the courts. And is another Jack Mannix ism is, you know, you want that last berry to roll off the court when you put it on there because we want our customers, um, you know, feeling like they get a good deal. We dip, you know, we charge eight ninety five a quart. So we want to make sure they're getting a good deal. Um, and then thorough harvest, I, you know, it's the hardest part, but don't leave any ripe berries because we may not get back to that section of row for, you know, four or five days. We want to make sure we pull all the berries that are ready off of there. Um, and then we do pick your own. Uh, like I said here, it used to be sort of clean up. Oh, you know, one year we had so many berries, let's open it up for pick your own. And well, we also do it as a perk for our farm stand CSA members, but um, but then it was like, oh, we just made $5,000 in two days. Let's do that again. And now it's become a really nice revenue source. And we're a little more, make a little more concerted effort. Um, as I say here, you know, concentrate times and days, at least for us, because, you know, if we were to leave it open all day, people would trickle in whenever they want. And we'd have like, we'd be man managing it for, all, you know, the whole day. So we just do like two to two and a half hours, like maybe four mornings a week. And that seems to concentrate folks and, uh, and we get good returns on the time we spend. So, and then you can see some bird netting for us. That's crucial. Most years we got cedar wax wings and I love, I'm an avid bird watcher and I uh, love seeing cedar wax wings, just not when they're in our strawberries. So. And then, um, yep, quickly we did day neutrals. You know, like I said, we love, they're nice when they're nice. We had the first year, they were amazing. <laughs> and we did this whole hoop system and we loved them. And uh, I think that's the picture with the black ground cloth. And then after that, three more years of, you know, medium to not so good. And, um, and I just decided I'm not, I'm done with them. <laughs> it's too much work and uh, we have other things to do. And quite honestly, if we have a farm stand, we buy in stuff. I can buy day neutral, you know, buy local straw, or, you know, regional strawberries um, pretty easily. So I, I take that route. And let's see what's left. Oh, so for us, yeah, it's an essential farm stand item. You know, strawberries, it's in June, there's not a lot of revenue. You know, you don't make that much money on, at least we don't, on lettuce and Swiss chard um, and, uh, and radishes. But when you have strawberries, it really brings people in. It's uh, people just, you know, there's like four weeks there, three to four weeks where they're really peaking. And, um, and we love it. It's, a, you know, like I said, it's a great draw and helps sell other things. Um, I'm trying to think, yeah. And we don't want them to come into, we don't like our strawberries too early because we don't really open our farm stand for produce. We're doing plants until the first weekend in June. And then people are still in school. But at that first day that school's out, strawberry sales double or something like that. You know, it's really, it's noticeable. So, yeah, so that's that we do sell some berries across the street to a place that makes ice cream and uh, awesome strawberry ice cream. And let's see what's left on the slides. Oh, that's it. And uh, thanks. If there's any questions, I don't know, I can look through the chat. Here. Thanks so much, Andrew. Sorry. Awesome. I uh, have some questions about pricing. What's the price for quartz and also for pints? And I guess you did mention retail. How about pick your own? And will you be raising your prices this year? Yes, we'll be raising our prices. I think it's hard to, it's just, it's hard to go above 8.95. We sell them for 8.95 a quart. And I think if you get two or two or more, it's like 8.50. Or if you get four or more, it's 8.50. I can't remember. And that's for quartz. Pints are 4.95. Um, 
and I just, you know, I maybe I'm I'm living the dark ages. It's hard to imagine. I would love to if people want to put in the chat what they're charging retail. I mean, it's one thing at a farm, you know, I always say one thing at a farmer's market, a farmer's market, it's kind of a buzz and you know, people are there once a week and they'll spend $9.95 for a quart or whatever. But uh, for us, you know, we're open every day. It's people treat us like a grocery store. So they're a little more price conscious. $8.95 is still a, a big stretch in my in my mind, you know, to drop for a quart of strawberries. So I'm not sure about pricing yet. Um, and then- pick your, How about pick your own? Oh, uh, pick your own, we're three fifty dollars a pound. So we end up charging like 6 or $7 a quart, I think. And so it's pretty good. So it's almost the same as retail, but we don't have to pay for the picking. What was the other question, Vern? I'm sorry. I think you answered it. It was about raising the price. And um, the other question was about how deep you install the drip tape. Oh, um, well, with the mechanical planter, it just has, it's in the shoe. If you guys know mechanical planters, it's got this shoe that the, the little basket fingers pick up your berry and they drop them, they drop it down. And the shoe is like here and it puts it down. I'd say it's like an inch or so above the bottom of the shoe or inch and a half. There's a little, um, like a little pulley. It's not a pulley, but it's just like a little spline that you put the drip tape underneath and it feeds it. And so you just have to hold the drip tape for the first foot or so that you're getting the transplanting till soil gets on it. And then it just goes along and it, we, oh, and one, one crucial aspect of that is we use the, the heavier drip tape, the 15 mil that we, when we bury it, because if you use the eight mil, you'll never pull it up. It'll just break on you constantly. And even the 15 mil breaks sometimes, but um, yeah. And then, you know, there's been years where we really haven't used the drip tape, but I'll tell you the years that we use it, it's, you know, pretty much the last three years we've used it both spring in planting and spring during uh, harvest or, you know, for this, the fruiting crop. When we've had a dry time, we'll definitely hit hit the hit the plants with water. It makes a huge difference for sure. The last question, just confirming you're on six foot centers with a single row. And that's what's correct. your yeah. rationale for that? Yeah. Um, well, that's what we're set up for. I mean, I guess we could we could get a little closer. Um but everything that we grow, like our tires are at 72 inch centers. So we just kind of stick with that. Um, and by the time the plants, you know, we try and keep them narrow, but it, I don't know, we could get a little closer, but then it's hard to, you know, who's ever driving the tractor and the transplanter. Um, maybe it's a little bit harder to drive straight sometimes. And, um, you know, like I said, also we have the, we have the field space. So, um, so it's not really, it's not, we're not feeling pressed for space just because we have access to more land than we need. Great, thank you so much. Welcome.